This is Pre-Market Prep. I'm Brianna Valeski with my co-host Joel Elkana, and we're joined by Todd Sullivan. He's the founder of Rand Strategic Partners. That's a long, short hedge fund. Todd is also the author of the Value Plays blog. Todd, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. So it looks like Rule 48 was invoked on the New York Stock Exchange again this morning. Uh, how did you make it through last week, and what are your thoughts on the market volatility today? So last week on Monday, uh, we were buyers and we bought Apple around 96 and we bought uh, AIG um, below where it is now. So we, we did pretty well last week. And if this continues today, I would happily be a buyer of both of those again. So um, as I look at the U.S. economy, um, there's nothing that concerns me. Um, most of the stuff I'm invested in is U.S. centric stuff anyway. So, um, you know, emerging markets will cause ripples and waves like this. But, um, you know, we got record retail sales, record employment, housing's returning back, record auto sales. So the U.S. economy is doing fine. You know, we just looked at those Q2 print 3.7, I think they revised it up to. Um, I find it hard to get alarmed at those kind of numbers and, um, kind of look at the recent sell-off and think it's a reason to dump everything I own. If anything on these large swings down, I'm, I'm more than happy to be adding to what I have. Yeah, that's a great point. Barron's came out with an article over the weekend listing a ton of bargain sw uh, stocks that you could have picked up you know, during some of these drops in the market we saw. Uh, you mentioned that you're mostly into stocks that are U.S. equities. Are you concerned at all about China, You know, the world's second largest economy? We just got more weak manufacturing data out of there. Uh, are you concerned, and do you think other concerns should, investors should be concerned with the slowdown in its economic growth? Well... So the way I look at China is, so I look at the U.S. GDP, right? It's about 85% consumption-based, 15% of our GDP and our economy's exports. Um, so if, if you took the most draconian scenario and wiped out every export the U.S. had, GDP falls from 3.7 to about 3.1, still fine. You know, of that 15%, I think 0.7, under 1% of our exports go to China. So... While China will have major headline news and will have effects on some other countries, um, I think its true effect on the U.S. economy is more uh, emotional and headline-driven than in reality. We, the fact of the matter is we are a buyer of Chinese goods, not an exporter to China in major ways. So even should, should China slow more, they're not going to cut off the spigot of the exports that the U.S. buys. If anything, those exports are going to become cheaper because they're going to be more desperate to sell them to us. So it's going to help the U.S. economy even more. So, you know, I look at China as an over-leveraged, probably over-margin market. Um, some people there are probably selling to cover stuff here. So there's some market effect to it. But the real effect on the U.S. economy, I... I don't see it being a major one. That, that doesn't mean the market might not swing crazily for a few weeks or a few months or do whatever. Um, but when you continue to look at the underlying U.S. economy and what's happening here, um, I don't, I don't see any any significant effect on it at all. Uh, taking a look at the U.S. economy and some uh, U.S. equities, you know, Warren Buffett came out and disclosed a $4.4 billion stake in Phillips 66 in a wager that oil prices will remain low and Americans are going to keep getting gas. Uh, is now the time to get into these oil and gas stocks? Yeah, I mean, oil and, oil and gas has, you know, the whole sector's pretty much been decimated. We really haven't seen a huge amount of fallout as far as, you know, some of the smaller players going under. Um, but the major players, they're going to be around. The Exxons, the, the 66, and they're going to be around. They're not going anywhere. And looking at some of them yielding 3 or 4%, given their footprint on the global stage and given their operating efficiencies, uh, for an investor like Buffett, who is looking at a time frame of many years down the road, yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean that might be not not be some short term some weakness, but if you know if your if your time range is three, five, ten years down the road, this is a great time to get into those. You know, oil prices. It's funny. 
whenever oil prices spike, we always talk about peak oil and running out of oil. And whenever they fall, now we're talking about a glut, right? Oil is the only commodity I know that goes from peak to glut in a matter of two years. <laughs> um, it, it's true. We only look at commodities in the extremes. So right now the extreme is negative. Um, the prices will go back up eventually. They will moderate. We've already seen the U.S. production starting to fall, right? Uh, rate constant come down. Uh, none of this happens instantly. It's a slow, gradual process. So U.S. production is going to fall, and the oil prices will start are, have and will continue to start to creep up, in which case, you know, it's kind of like when Buffett bought Bank of America in 2009, was it? Uh, you know, everyone kind of shook their head, but three years later, he was, you know, he's printing billions. And it'll be the same thing with this. Those are just fine with it. That's a great point to kind of make the analogy of the same thing. Back in 2009, he's buying Bank of America, and now we're seeing the low oil prices, and he's getting into Phillips 66. So maybe maybe it's the yeah. time to, to follow Warren Buffett into some of these oil and gas stocks. What about airliners? Uh, Deutsche Bank upgrading a few of them this morning, taking both Delta and American Airlines up to a buy rating. Uh, we're kind of hitting the end of the summer vacation cycle, so what do you think about buying airliners right now? You know... Airlines are tough for me. Uh, I don't. I don't really know. Um, I don't know who said it, but the best quote by airlines I ever heard was, um, "There's an easy way to become a millionaire. Um, start with ten million dollars and invest in airline stock." <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they've really been a boom bust kind of thing, and I think right now that they are. They are benefiting from low oil prices. Um, they are going to be able to hedge, right? Their fuel purchases for the next couple years. Um, at prices that are that low. So even if prices rise, they'll still going to do very well. Um, you know, for me, uh, I would never look at an airline in any other way other than a trade. I would never look at it as an investment or a core part of a portfolio simply because there's just so many dynamics of government intervention to, to merger. I, it's just, it, it doesn't, I don't see a scenario where they work out long term, but given that, Right now, with energy prices low, they're going to have their input costs be low for a couple of years, and that will be a tailwind for them. And like I said, the U.S. economy is doing just fine, and it's actually getting better. So more people are going to start to travel. More people are going to fly. So, yeah, I can, I can see some strength in there for, for some time. JetBlue would be my favorite just because I love that airline, but... Yeah, JetBlue is definitely seems like one of the leaders in the sector. Frank Zarilla from Zor Trades has been on the show, and he referred to airliners as hedge fund hotels. Do you feel the same way about it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a short anything anything you do with airlines is short term, short term. You can't yeah you can't look at this and say you know, this is a great. You can't look at Buffett's purchase of Phillips sixty six and purchasing an airline. It's a completely different prism you have to look mm-hmm. through. One's a trade, one's an investment. And as long as you don't try and push the investment into I mean, the trade into an investment, then I'm, you can do well with it. But you got to be nimble and you got to be ready to say, you know, I'm getting out of this thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point, always distinguishing between what's a trade and what's an investment. Yeah. Um, we've got a question. And there is some litigation, and there is some litigation risk with those because there isn't a Justice, yeah. Par- Justice Department or someone looking into price fixing, you know, so – who knows what ends up there, right? Do they all get fined? Do they decide, you know, you never really know when the government gets involved and stuff like that, what they're going to decide to do. And that could be a shock to the system for the airlines too. So just something to keep an eye on if you're in them. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a question coming out of our chat room here. Uh, Chris wants to know why oil prices would rise. You know, who's going to stop supplying at these prices? Well, U.S. US production already is done. Right, U.S. production is already starting to fall. Recounts are starting to fall. Oil, oil prices at the extremes don't trade on fundamentals. Right, they trade on emotion. Oil has become a hedge commodity. Right, when when we were when oil was one hundred and forty seven dollars a barrel, it wasn't really because of the fundamentals. It was because people at that time were talking about hyperinflation. You got to own assets. You got to own commodities. So everyone piled into the oil trade. And then when that didn't happen, people started piling out. Prices fell back down to 100. Now we have a quote unquote glut of oil. So oil is down to 30. Now, U.S. production and now versus six months ago isn't all that much different, but the price of oil is about $70 a barrel less. U.S. demand is consistent. 
So what you see, when you see oil prices like this, it's, it's people's expectations of the future. And with oil in particular, they always go to the extreme, but they all, it always comes back and levels out. So, you know, the fundamentals of oil are getting better for a price increase. The U S producers, they want to, they are really pushing hard to be able to export the oil, which would even eliminate U S stockpiles even more, not eliminate lower is a better word. Um, so that could cost them upward pressure on prices also. So there's a couple of things to look for, but I'm not calling for $120 oil, but I think somewhere in the 50 to $70 range at a consistent level for the next year or so is, is reasonable to expect while things sort of start to rationalize. What about something like Twitter, you know, totally switching gears and going over to stock, tech stocks? Twitter can't seem to figure out revenue yeah. growth, haven't announced a new full-time CEO. Seems like the company might be lacking vision right now. Is is there any reason investors should still have faith in Twitter? You know, Twitter's one of those, it's a really weird thing because I can look at Twitter and say they haven't figured out advertising anywhere near as effectively as Facebook has. Exactly. Um, and they're not going to be able to monetize it. It would be a, some kind of a subscription thing or anything like that. So the the, the uh, platform is short 140-word character boosts, and if they start to clutter that with big ads, stuff like that, it starts to become less useful. So they see subscriber drop-offs. It's really hard to tell. But by the same token... Could and but then you look at the flip side and say, well, could a Google or an Apple just buy the thing and kind of meld it into what they're doing with their stuff? And Google uh, was it Google Plus? Was it? it was kind of a disaster. So would Google buy Twitter and kind of mold it all in there? So I have a hard time saying um, they're going to be driftless for a while because I can completely see a scenario where someone buys them next week. So it's one of those things that if you're in it. I mean, could things get worse for them? Put it that way, right? So I guess if they hired an off, a CEO everyone hated, that might be bad for them. But, but if, they, if, they buy, if they hire a CEO who's a top-notch tech guy, then maybe the stock rallies hard, right? I think the stock's where it is now because, it's, like you said, it's kind of driftless. It's kind of just kind of wandering around out there with no real direction. You get a good CEO who has a clear vision or you get some interest from a major, major tech company, you have a completely different story overnight and shares could rally on that. Yeah, that's a great point. It's just kind of waiting on that one fundamental piece that could be the catalyst for this stock. Um, anything else that you're looking at right now? I know we've talked about AIG multiple times. You said you picked up some last week. Yeah. You might be picking some out, some more up today. What else is on your radar this morning? So I like um, Fannie and Freddie is interesting for me. Um, really? There's a, Couple, yeah, there's a couple of things going on that um, le would lead one to believe that the White House isn't particularly interested in what's being uncovered through discovery being made public and seeing that taxpayers have been paid back um, at a profit. Um, it might just make sense and be in the best interest of everyone to kind of call it a day and let's move on. Um, there was a golf, uh, there was a, a law company called, uh, Crutcher who represents, uh, Richard Perry in the litigation. Uh, they had a senior partner who's an U S trade ambassador, played golf with, uh, President Obama and Martha's Vineyard, uh, last week or the week before, I think it was six days later, the white house requested access to privileged information in that case. Now the, I, don't know what was discussed in any golf clouding, but I find the timeline of this law firm getting access to the information, a partner then playing golf with Obama five days later and five days after that, the White House wanting to get involved, kind of odd. Um, politically, the administration can make um, an election year, can do great things by ending the conservatorship, declaring victory, with the GSEs, expanding lending to low-income buyers, the government, you know, we've been paid back with a, with a, with, with a profit, our intervention worked, um, versus the downside and what's being uncovered in these documents could be a political um, quagmire for the administration going into elections. You know, why didn't you know what was going on? 
the government is being accused of saying a bunch of stuff publicly that in the documents being uncovered are complete, those, those comments are being completely contradicted. Uh, in some cases, outright contradiction. Um, they may not want those documents to come public. And the only way to do that is to settle the case. Now everyone walks away. No one knows anything and we'll see where we go from there. But, um, and I'm not a huge believer in coincidences like that when it comes to the timing of events. I think, uh, um, you know, I, you can't say either way what happened, but it, it is curious timing. And given we're coming up to an election year, you know, the administration may be looking at, you know, what are our options with the GSEs to get the most political bang for our buck heading into an election? Um, and I think settling the cases, releasing them from conservatorship, claiming victory on all fronts, right, uh, is the political appealing way to go to the administration versus the risk of a long drawn out trial in which documents that do not paint the government's actions in the most honest light come to bear, in which case the administration would have to deny knowing about it. And then people are going to ask them, well, why didn't you know? You've been in there for seven years. These, these entities have been in conservatorship for seven years. Why didn't you know what was going on? That's not what a party or the administration wants heading into an election year. So I think for political reasons, um, there may be some movement there and it might be quite interesting. Now, before the Sweeney court, the government has lost everything. They've lost the motion to dismiss. They've lost the motion to squash discovery. They've lost um, an overly restrictive uh, definition of what's protected information. And now um, the big ruling before Judge Sweeney is the plaintiffs have requested several documents to be released to the public. The government is with everything it has fighting the release of those documents. And the only reason you fight that is because what's in those documents is very damaging to your case. That's the only reason you fight it. Okay. So depending what Judge Sweeney rules, um, things could get very interesting very fast. So we'll see what this keep on. There's no timing for her ruling. She could rule. Tomorrow she could rule in two months. We'll have to just see what she does. So, and the cases before the appeals court, also. And um, so there's a lot of moving levers, and we're getting towards some major decision times in those cases. And I think <clears throat> if I put myself in the shoes of the administration, I can take control of this situation right now and use it for my political gains. Which, let's be honest, the politicians that's what we expect them to do, right? Um, you can, whatever party side you're on, no matter who is in the White House right now, would want to use this for their political benefit. Um, you can either take control, use your benefit, or let the courts decide and kind of roll the dice that you get judgments in your favor. And if you don't, it could, it could really be bad really quick. So, you know, you're talking 200 plus billion dollars. If one of these judges rules the net worth sweep illegal, the administration's got to figure out why they're going to have to pay 220 billion dollars back to shareholders, right? That's not something you want to have to explain in an election year. So we'll see where it goes. But um, at $2 and change a share for the common, you can think of it like a call option with no expiration, right? This okay. case can go on for six months or two years, and you still have your call option. And, and if plaintiffs win, that gets very valuable very quickly. So we've got just a couple of minutes left with you here, Todd. Uh, get your take on interest rates. You know, we... Like it seemed like we were on track for a September rate hike, and then we've just seen a lot of volatility in the stock market. But the Fed says they don't really follow what's going on based on the stock market. Do you think we have enough economic data to support a rate hike this month? Yes, I thought I thought that in June too. So don't take really? my, okay. my word that they're going to actually hike. So uh, we do, and I think the real risk for the Fed now, I think the real risk is that they don't raise. Because if they don't raise now, after insinuating for some time now that a rate hike was coming, it looks as though the market rules the Fed. And I think that's a real risk a to the Fed point. and confidence in the Fed that they are dependent not on the data, not on the economic data, not on employment, not on anything else but the stock market. And that would make a lot of people lose confidence in the Fed, I think. There's no reason that 3.7% GDP – record retail sales, record auto sales, record employment levels, 5% employment rate. There's no reason not to raise a quarter point. We're not talking, 
you know, raising from five to seven. We're talking going from zero to a quarter. I think the mental, you know, the Fed is raising because of economic strength and they want to need to get rates where they should be. Interest rates shouldn't be this where they are right now. They should normalize. So I think, um, I think the bigger risk, I have no, I have no idea what the market's going to do if they raise. I can see a scenario where it shows extreme confidence in the economy and it rallies. I can see a scenario with it where, you know, like they had a taper tantrum. Remember the taper was going to destroy the, mm-hmm. the market and the economy? Well, mm-hmm. neither one of those happened either, right? You have the sell off, but then people realize, wait a minute, they're only doing this because the economy's fine. So we want to be in U.S. equities. We don't want to sell them. So, um, but I think I, I will be disappointed if they don't. Um, I think they should do something. They should have done something in June. And every, Every, every metric you look at in the U.S. economy warrants warrants a raise. You know, people will bring up emerging markets, but that's not that's not the Fed's mandate. The Fed's mandate is U.S. focused. They're not, you know, they're not the world's bank. They're the, they're the U.S. Federal Reserve. We've been on the line with Todd Sullivan. He's the founder of Rand Strategic Partners. That's a long, short hedge fund. Todd, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate your insight, and we'll definitely have to have you on again soon. Pleasure. Thank you.